Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome back to Sin Stuff. This is episode four of the Juno 106 restoration series, the final episode. So I worked on this synth for about three and a half, four hours last night and disaster struck. Let me tell you what happened. Like I said, I was working on this for hours last night. I got the control board out, all taken apart, replaced all the controls, desoldered, resoldered, tested, put it all back together, cleaned everything out, got the key bed installed, and then I went to transfer all the video from my camera and my microphone into my computer and got distracted. I had a phone call come in while I was doing it, wasn't paying attention to what I did, and I managed to delete all the video footage, three and a half hours of video footage. Uh, I was so angry, I said some really bad words. And this has happened once or twice before when I lost video footage for one reason or another. And in that, when it's happened before, I just said, oh well, I guess I'll do it better the second time, went back and reshot the video. This time I can't do that because I was restoring a synth. I can't undo what I did last night. So what I'm gonna have to do is uh, basically pull stuff out, show you what I did, but you aren't gonna actually see me doing it. The only evidence that I do have that I did it was this picture that I took uh, last night as I was working on it just before I started desoldering things. So let's have a look. I'll show you how I took things out and I'll have we can have a look at how I actually worked on it and what the end result is. Then we'll put it all back together and turn it on and see if it works because I haven't done that yet. All right, the very first thing that you want to do in order to get this control board out is to remove all these caps on the sl various sliders. And they are just press fit, so you can just pull them off like I'm doing right here. It does not take a whole lot of force. I did clean all of these using the Honda spray polish that uh, I've used to clean everything else. And uh, all I did was just put them on a, a clean towel, spray them, and then wipe all the various edges because they were pretty gritty and filthy just like everything else on this synth. And then there are several screws across the bottom of the control board that need to be removed. And as you can see, I'm using my Vessel Stubby GIS driver. Link is in the description. When I took this out, I actually took out the MIDI board over here as well. Uh, there's just four screws holding it in. I didn't do a whole lot with that other than clean it out with some isopropyl alcohol and contact cleaner some Deoxid D5. All right, so now that we've removed all the screws for this board, we just tilt the bottom out slightly and then there are tabs in the top of the board that fit into slots in the case. So you can see coming out here and then the board is free to come out. Now, obviously I've already replaced all these components now. So if you look at them, they're all nice and shiny and new, uh, but these uh, dust covers, which are nice and new and flexible, were not the same on the old ones. They were old and brittle and hard. So when I went to take them off, they just crumbled into dust. So that took quite a bit of cleaning to, to clean up. The sliders, there's actually all sliders except for the, uh, which one is it? This one here, this is a switch. So you can see the sliders look like this and the switch looks like this. These were all quite filthy. Uh, quite a few of them, like this one here, had rust on them. If you have a look at the picture I took here, you can see all the old ones still installed on the board. Uh, a lot of corrosion and dust. This is after I took off the covers. There's quite a bit of evidence here that at some point in this synthesizer's life, somebody dumped a beverage into the top of it, unfortunately. Now it's possible that some of the rust on these sliders came from a cow pasture. As you can see from these pictures, my good buddy Rob from Slave the Square Wave. Hey, if you haven't checked out Slave the Square Wave, I'll put a link to them in the description. You really need to check that band out. 
In any case, here he is doing a rave in a cow pasture in Oakville, Ontario. And, and as you can see, in all its glory, here is the Juno 106 on an A-frame in the middle of a cow pasture. Yes, this was a rave in, I believe, the early 90s, and yes, it did rain. I also did change these switches out. These have little caps that just pop on top of the switch, and you can see there's a little switch there, so those have been swapped out as well. To get to the tactile switches, if you look at the bottom of the board, there's just plastic little plastic tabs in there. If you squeeze them together, then the plastic keycap just pops right off. And Roland, very helpful, put uh, a W here that tells you it's W and, it, and where you get a, a set of three that are connected, it'll say B3. So you know when you're putting it back together, a group of three blue ones goes there and a single white one goes here. So once you take all those caps off, it gives you access to the little tactile buttons right here. So I desoldered those, and each of those has four little pins that you want to desolder. Like here's one of the old ones here. And so you, you desolder those, pop them out, put the new ones in, and solder the new ones in place. Same goes for these, just desolder. I used my desoldering pump that I showed uh, previously when I was using it to uh, replace the voice chips in the voice board, same exact procedure. Soldering pump, suck the solder out of it, make sure the pins are free, and then once it's free, you can gently just wiggle it free of the board. Now this is a single-sided board, uh, so it is a little bit easier to work on. The traces are not quite as fine and delicate as on the voice board, so it doesn't take as much care, but you do still have to be careful. So over here, there is an R24 that's a resistor and for it is used for the LEDs on these three LEDs right here for the save, verify, and load. Normally, these LEDs would only ever one of them be on at a time, so they just use one single resistor as a load for them. However, on, with the Kiwi 6 board, it can show all three of these at once, in which case it's too dim. So one modification you have to make for the Kiwi, uh, the Kiwi 106 board is just to solder a jumper across that uh, resistor right there, which I have done. And you do notice that the, the original sliders did not have, that you can see right into them, and the new ones actually have covers on them to try and keep dust and crud out, which is really nice. Because if I take this one here, I'm just uh, bend open the tabs that hold it open, you can see what's actually inside it. So there's only two components to it. The first is the actual slider, and it's got a set of contacts which are spring-loaded and push up against the resistor. And you can see there's some dirt and fluff in there. And uh, that is pretty much common for all of these. And that's what causes problems is that kind of dirt and dust in there. And this slider piece then just slides up and down this variable resistor right here, just like this. These two contacts make a contact between these two paths on there. And if there's any dirt or dust or any foreign substance, which you can see there's quite a bit in there, it causes the values to kind of jump around a bit as because that stuff is either conductive or non-conductive or prevents conduction. And as a result, you get sticky sliders, you get uh, jumpy sliders or malfunctioning sliders. So that's what's inside each of these. This one, the switch is a bit different. It just has a bunch of contacts in there. When I did install that switch, and you can see it right here, it's different than the others, uh, I had some problem because this is not a part that's manufactured anymore. So I got it from Centaur, and uh, a third-party aftermarket manufacturer made this. The pin spacing on it was not quite right. If you have a look at the original, you can see the pin spacing on it, and the, the replacement, the pins were just a little bit too wide this way. And so I did have to bend them a little bit. Actually, no, it was the other way around. They were a little bit too close together. So I did have to do a little bit of finagling and bending in order to get that seated in there properly. Uh, this is also polarity sensitive. You, you need to make sure it goes in the right way. You can, if you're not careful, insert it the wrong way. You don't want that. On the other hand, the sliders, um, 
have a pin layout that is slightly different on one side than the other. If you look on this side, these two are closer together than these two. So it's impossible to insert these the wrong way around because it won't fit. The switches are very simple. They just go in so the, the uh, legs are on either side, as you can see on this one here, legs on either side. Once you've finished installing all your new parts, the keycaps just go back in, just snap in place. So you just push them gently and snap them on. After I'd removed all of the components, all the old components off this board, I did wash this board. I used a 99.9% .9 anhydrous isopropyl alcohol, washed all the dirt and filth and, and grease and everything off this board because there was quite a bit of it, uh, and then let it completely dry before installing all the new components. So to put it back in, we're just gonna reinstall these dust covers. Then we will push it down. Now you can see these tabs here, and there are slots in the case those tabs fit into. And we'll pull the bottom out slightly. And hopefully not lose any of those dust covers in the process. Let's make sure they're all still in place. And then once we've got that in place, now we can just start reinstalling the screws. Next, we can reinstall the keycaps. And like I said, they are just a press fit, so you just gently press them on. I should mention that I did clean the top case and the, the side case of this synth while I had it apart uh, using the Honda spray cleaner and polish. Once again, link in the description. The Synth Cleaner of Champions. And that's it. That's as far as I got last night. Of course, it took me a lot shorter amount of time this time because I wasn't uh, desoldering 34 sliders and however many switches there are. There was, a, it, there was a lot of them and it took a long time, just hours and hours of desoldering. And well, the resoldering doesn't take so long, but the desoldering certainly does. Okay, so now we are at the moment of truth. It's put back together. It should be ready to turn on and test. I'm gonna have one last minute inspection inside just to make sure everything appears to be connected properly and no cables are pinched. Uh, if everything looks good, we'll power it up, test it, and then assuming that's all working good, we'll do the calibration. So let's try that now. This is it, the moment of truth. It's plugged in, I've inspected all the cables, everything looks good, the, the connectors are all connected properly. It's ready to power up, it's plugged into my mixer. Let's see if any smoke comes out. All right, here we go. Ready, three, two, one, go. And the, LC, the uh, display is lighting up and showing things. That's good. That means the Kiwi 6 board is working. It's showing patch 1.1. One, one. That's also good. Let's see if we have any sound. Oh, yes. Let's see how many voices we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six voices and it's stealing the bottom voice, so it's working correctly. So we have six voices sounding. They all sound like they're in tune. Close this slightly so we have access to the front panel. Obviously this is gonna work differently because it is a Kiwi 106, not a Juno 106 processor. I do have on order an overlay for this that actually sticks on top and gives you all, it looks basically the same, except it has all the new functions on here because it's, they're just far too many to remember. So it's patch one one, let's try patch one two. Oh nice, let's try the chorus, chorus two.
it appears to be working. It works. And it sounds amazing. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of speechless. This has been a lot of work and it's it's been fairly costly, but I think it's worth it. Okay, so now we know it's working. Uh, we have to calibrate the voice board, which is all these little tiny potentiometers that we have over here, as you can see. So there is a procedure for doing that and I've got the service manual, so we're gonna dig that out and start that next. We put it into test mode by holding down the save button while turning it on. And it comes up with a flashing one with an underscore, which says test mode is active, so that's correct. And then on the Kiwi 106 instructions, we have a, a nice little diagram that shows us where all the test points are on the voice board, helps us locate them, which is uh, very helpful of them. So step one. To do this work, you do need a oscilloscope and a voltmeter. I have a voltmeter over here, which you can see. And we should be seeing between 0.25 and 0.27 volts. So we want 250 millivolts, and that's as low as I'm gonna get it, so close enough. Okay, press bank one to override the MUX override. Now, with the oscilloscope, we're gonna connect our scope to test point eight. So what we're looking for is a minimum amount of thump when we press a key. And as you can see, as I'm pressing key, I'm seeing some thumping in there. What we wanna see is almost none of that. Okay, there's one. Now we do the same thing for voice two, using number 25. So what you're seeing here compressed into 30 seconds is just over an hour of work where I repeatedly went through all the different voices and filters and settings to calibrate everything to exactly the factory settings, what they should be. You can see a lot of different waveforms that I'm using. I'm matching waveforms to make sure the filters are in the correct frequency range and as well as the envelope times. So we finished calibrating. Uh, it took quite a while, probably about an hour and a half, primarily the filters. And But because all the, uh, the filters and envelopes are new because these chips are brand new, that meant that all of this was really kind of out of calibration. Plus it didn't help that all these tiny little uh, trim pots haven't been moved in 40 years and they were really stiff. So my, my uh, um, little plastic adjuster screwdriver thing here just wasn't hacking it. I had to switch to a metal one because these things are so sticky that my plastic one was just twisting and not turning them. So, um, and it also takes quite a while because especially for the filters, when you adjust the bottom end, then you adjust the top end which also is adjust the bottom end. So you gotta repeat the bottom end, which then adjusts the top end. So you gotta, you gotta keep adjusting them in and, in, and you know, gradually they go closer and closer and closer until they're, they're right on both of them. But it does take kind of a, a lot of a jockeying back and forth to get that done, which takes time. But we're done, it's all calibrated. It's in perfect shape, you know, factory fresh uh, condition. It's ready to play. I did take some infrared video of the internal components just to see if anything was running overly hot. Uh, as you can see, the voice chips are running very warm, uh, surprisingly warm. In fact, those are the hottest components in the entire synth. No wonder the uh, original Roland epoxy broke down. There was one other component that was a little warm and that is the rectifier over on the power supply. It is nowhere near a temperature where I would actually be worried about it. Actually, there is one thing we still have to do and that's put the uh, screws in the end cheeks. So we're gonna close it up. There we go.
those screws were a lot harder to reinstall than they should have been. This label that Kiwi 106 sent should go on right here, I think. I've assumed that everything is actually working on here, but we should go over the controls. And first the key bed. Okay, so all the keys are working, that's good. We'll check uh, all the different bank and selection are all working. Let's check all the different controls and sliders. Bender is working, portamento. Working. Uh, we can change the LFO. LFO on the bender is working. The bender, we can change the DCO or the filter. Or both. That's working. LFO obviously is working. We can change the delay time. Good. Good, that's working. Pulse width. Okay, pulse width is working. Is there a sawtooth? Sub, sub oscillator? Noise? Our filter, high pass filter, working. Obviously, the cutoff envelope. Envelope for the filter is working. LFO is working. Key tracking. It's working. Uh, VCA, the amount of VCA. And that's working. Or just gate, that's working. Chorus, no chorus. Working good. Our key transpose. Okay, well, all of these, actually the functionality has changed with the Kiwi 106 edition. So uh, let's go over what has actually changed uh, with the functionality or added to the functionality of our Juno 106 now that we've added a Kiwi 106 uh, capability. So let's talk about what's changed with the Kiwi 106 modification. First off, Instead of 128 patch storage play, uh, positions, we now have 512. Originally, we had one through eight on the bank and one through eight on the patch number, so that's 64, and then we could select from group A or group B, so that gave us 128 in total. Now, we can actually hold down the group and press bank, and now that's group one, and now we can select one one, or one two, and so on all of our main patches and then we can hold it down and then press up to eight. So we have up to eight groups and each of those has another 64 patches in it. So that gives us a lot more storage and the first 128, which is group one, is the original uh, Juno 106 factory patches. Those patches are stored in flash memory. So no more battery. There's no battery to ever replace. We don't need to worry about a battery running out and losing our patch storage. Something useful, over here, all our bend settings, all the DCO settings, the VCF, LFO, portament, all this stuff that we'd have to set as part of our performance panel, 
all these settings are now stored as part of the patch. So if you change these settings because that's how you want that patch to be able to be played, now they get stored with the patch. That did not happen before. Every parameter in here is now accessible uh, via MIDI CC and SysX. And all those these values in here are actually stored as 12-bit uh, resolution. So instead of 0 to 127, we have 0 to 4096. Gives us a lot more control over the various parameters. You can also dump and load patches via SysX. The Juno 106, when it was made, it was one of the first MIDI synthesizers, so the, the MIDI implementation in it was quite primitive. So now we have a lot of uh, additional MIDI capability that didn't exist when this thing was made. As such, the MIDI switch on the back here now has no function, so it, and it, it doesn't actually do anything anymore. The memory protect still does. It does exactly what it always has. Because we can now load and save patches via SysX, there is now a free patch editor that we'll look at in a little bit that you can use with the Juno 106 to edit patches and store them on a computer, a PC or a Mac. All right, the original Juno 106 had two different key modes. We had Poly 1, Poly 2. Poly 1, you got to, uh, it would sound like this. You would get six notes and then it would steal the bottom, the first note played when you played the seventh. So like... You can hear it stealing the bottom notes as I play it. It also had a poly 2 mode where when you got the seventh note, nothing played. That's unchanged. It also had a unison mode where you, where you just played, if you press these together, you just got unison. Every, every note, to, uh, every voice played at once. So that's all six voices playing at once. The Kiwi 106 obviously has those same functions. It also has three others. And because there's six different modes, the way you use it is by holding down poly one and then pressing one through six. So I'm gonna press four, which is unison, but in staccato mode. And the difference between legato and staccato mode is that in legato mode, which is what the Juno 106 originally did, the envelope attack stage uh, is only triggered if all the notes are released, whereas the staccato is play, the envelope is triggered for every key press. So let's put it into ver, um, mode three, which is the legato that we had originally on the Juno 106, and we'll set up uh, an envelope here. Let's see. Okay, so now we hear that envelope playing. So now I'm going to play several notes. You hear the envelope was only being triggered for that first note. If we switch to staccato mode, every time I press or release a key, the envelope gets triggered again. Uh, we also have mono. Uh, legato mode, which is the same as unison, but just with a single voice. Or we can go to staccato mode. So you can definitely hear the difference between unison mode, where all the voices are playing, and mono mode, where only one voice is playing. Because this is all done with the poly 1 key, now our poly 2 key is used as a hold function. So if we switch back to regular poly one mode. So now we have a hold function that we did not have previously. You can only do that before if you had a pedal that you could plug in there. Let's go back to unison mode, which is uh, here. We did not have portamento. In the Kiwi 106, we do. We also have that in arpeggiator and chord modes. The original Juno 106 has a single LFO and a single envelope generator. So the LFO can be connected to the oscillator as well as the filter. The envelope generator can be connected to the amplifier and the filter. The Kiwi 106 has two LFOs and two envelopes 
and each of those can be connected to either thing. So if I wanted one, one LFO to modulate the oscillator and a second LFO to modulate the, the filter differently from the first LFO, we can do that. Similar if we want one envelope modulating the VCA and a separate envelope modulating the filter in a different way, we can also do that. The envelopes can be inverted. Here you can see we can, we can invert this envelope, but we can also do the same thing for the VCA now if we want. The LFO, we can also invert it. We can make it bipolar or unipolar if we need to just to change something up and not pull it back down. And there's also six different waveforms that we can associate with the LFO. While the, the key bed in the Juno 106 is not velocity sensitive, nor does it have aftertouch, the Kiwi 106 will accept both of those parameters via MIDI and you can map them to any number of different parameters that you want to. So if you want uh, aftertouch to open up a filter and you want velocity to change the, the slope of the amplifier or what have you, you can do that. So if you're playing your Juno 106 from a different keyboard that does have those features, it, the Kiwi 106 will recognize them and play them. We can transpose notes just like we could before, but now we can go either an octave up or an octave, uh, or sorry, two octaves up or an octave down. And sequencer, which we'll talk about in a moment, can be transposed while it's playing. We do have chord mode as well, which again, we'll talk about. A noticeable change for the Juno 106 when it came out, it did not have an arpeggiator. Well, let's fix the Kiwi 106 has an arpeggiator. It has an up, down or up, down. Uh, random, you can play in a pattern for the arpeggiator and it will, it will play through that. The arpeggiator will go from zero, one or two octaves. You can start, stop or continue it from MIDI. The arpeggiator outputs MIDI. Uh, you can clock it from the internal clock or you can, uh, an external clock that you can plug in over your uh, patch shift. You can put a pulse into there and it will clock from that. Or you can use a MIDI clock. I did mention we have a sequencer now as well. Just like the Kiwi 6, we have an eight separate 124 step polyphonic sequencer. Uh, so they're not stored per patch, it's eight different sequences stored for the entire synthesizer and we can call up and associate those with any patch. So if we have, uh, we've stored a sequence into sequence number one, we can associate any number of patches to point to sequence one. So whenever we select that patch and hit play, that sequence will start playing. We also have a pattern generator, which is somewhat like automation, where we can have eight different patterns saved with two to 16 steps. And uh, for instance, we could take a, a VCF and, and put a cutoff in a pattern, and then we can apply that to independently of a sequence, and we have control over how much of that pattern is being applied to the sounds. So if we had a pattern that was repeating over a few notes that was doing something with the filter, we could fade in and out how much that's actually taking effect on the sound. Now all of this is obviously using the original control board of the of this Juno 106, which means there's an awful lot of new functionality that was never intended to be used on here. There is an overlay that you can order. I have ordered it. It's actually out of stock. They have new ones coming when it comes. It just basically sticks on top of this. It looks exactly the same. It, it just has lots more parameters and things. So once that arrives, all I have to do is take these keycaps off again, uh, clean this, stick it on top, put the key back, caps back on and it, it'll have all that new functionality detailed right there. Looking at the key transpose, it's very simple, is we're working with normally middle C. If we press key transpose and press a different key, you can see it changes it here and now it's transposed it up. If we want to transpose it to G, it'll do that. And if we want to go back to middle C, we can do that. Now it's back to C and we've removed that key transpose, very simple. How we get to all the different functionality in the Kiwi 106 is through a bunch of different pages. There's five different pages and how we get to the different pages is by holding down MIDI and then pressing one through five. So if we press one, we're now on page one or page two and you can see it's changing different pages. So what are those pages? Norm page one is normal play mode. Uh, our LFO and envelope controls will edit LFO one and envelope one. Uh, we have normal arpeggiator play and chord play meth modes. If we go into number two, now our LFO and envelope controls are editing LFO two and envelope two. This is our sequence play mode. Uh, page or Group three is our pattern play mode. Page four is, allows us to do sysx dumps. And page five is 
global parameters where we can change the the parameters of the settings of different things in the synth. This is like your your main configuration menu. Of course, we need to be able to adjust the tempo of the sequencer and the arpeggiator. How do we adjust that? It's adjusted through the LFO rate. And normally the LFO rate is going to adjust the LFO rate, obviously. But if we press and hold down key transpose, we can actually see that we're adjusting the, the LFO rate in BPM here. Chord mode, they recommend you always use middle C as the, the bass note. So you press, you play a chord while holding it down, press the poly button. Now we have a chord every time we press a note. And we can just change it by playing another chord. Just by pressing it again, it cancels chord mode. The menu structure in here is really complex. I could really go into the weeds, but if you really want to know more about the Kiwi 106 and all this functionality, you can download the manual from the Kiwi Technics website. It's actually really well documented. They have all kinds of graphic uh, menuing and they have a, a lot of diagrams to show exactly how you access all the different functionalities and features in here. Probably the best thing about the Kiwi 106 is that it, you get this free editor and it is really well written and it works so much better than a lot of editors that I've used in the past. You basically just start it, it looks at all your different MIDI ports, finds the Kiwi 106, connects to it, automatically transfers everything so you have all your data here. So now I have, this is a, a representation of my Kiwi 106, which is plugged in on the other side of the room. I can change patches. I can play, I can actually play the thing. I don't know where these names are coming from, but but more interestingly, you can see when you select any of these patches, what all the values are of all the different parameters. So if you see this funky three, how did that get created? Well, here, here you go, just have a look and you can see. And then of course you can change any of these things if I wanted to change the, the envelope. Uh, let's see, the VCF, and it is connected to envelope one, I can see right there. So, and then the VCA is also connected to envelope one. No, nothing is connected to envelope two. So let's switch the VCF to envelope two. And then we can change the, the, the uh, decay on, on the VCF. It sounds like we have some noise in there. I see it right there, so. Which we're hearing because we're allowing more of it to come through in that, which is pretty cool. So we could do editing of all these different parameters. And what do we have here? Patch 1985, 2015. What the hell is that? Oh, okay. So this is <laughs> interesting. So this is 1985. This is how the synthesizer looked in 1985 when it came out. If we want to switch this to 2015, now we have something that looks like a modern synthesizer layout. And we can change, oh, I don't know what we can do here. Here's our VCA gates and source. Where is the, where is the, where is the actual envelope? Oh, here's the envelope over here. So you can see we, can, we have a graphical representation of it. We can just drag and drop the envelopes this way. That's really cool. And then here's all the different uh, LFO uh, waveforms that we have. We can have a random LFO. So let's see if we have a random LFO and we're gonna connect that to the DCO. So where's our LFO connection here? Source, uh, DCO, frequency, LFO two. So let's try that and see what happens. If we bring the rate up, nothing. Um, what do we have to do here? Oh, we have to put the amount up. So let's, how do we change that? Oh, okay. Okay, so now it's it's going away because our envelope is low, so let's do this. So let's bring the rate up. And the portmanteau is interesting. So now you can hear that that random LFO is making the the oscillator 
change frequency quickly. In our VCF, we have an uh, envelope taking effect here. So let's get rid of that. So we have no envelope on the VCF and we'll just crank the uh, low pass up. <laughs> now we can hear that LFO taking effect. Well, that sounds terrible. It sounds like a, an awful B. So let's uh, turn that down and we'll bring the LFO over to the filter. Let's switch that to LFO too. That's pretty cool. All right, so I've been playing around with this a bit. You can see that you can get into all the different features of the Kiwi 106 and it looks like they have a little flux capacitor up here. That's cute. But all, all the different features of the, the Kiwi 106 um, are available in here. So you could do a lot of programming on your computer rather than you know going through the arcane little bits of menu structure in the, the Kiwi 106, which makes this so much more useful. And then you, you can make these changes, store it back to the synthesizer and go over there and play exactly what you've programmed here. But I do think one of the most valuable things is being able to look at patches and see how they're, how they're made. I, I do like this 2015 layout. Uh, I think, well, I don't know. I could, I could work with either of these, I suppose. And hey, look at this. I didn't even see this in the manual originally, but uh, the Kiwi 106 lets you detune voices. So here's a note that I'm just playing, but if I put it into unison mode and you hear all the voices playing at once, now if I start detuning it, it'll start detuning the voices away from each other. And you can hear all the voices are, are kind of like a little bit out of tune with one another and you get a little bit of movement and, and almost a chorusing effect from it. We do have patterns and sequences in here. I like how you can actually uh, create names and, and notes for all the different presets that you're, you're setting up so that you, you can keep that. Uh, let's see, can we save this? There's manuals. Say, oh yeah, we can save all this locally. So you could have multiple sets. You could save this, so share it with friends. Wow, this is really impressive. I am so impressed with this upgrade. So let's make a track with this new Juno 106. That's it, that's the end of this episode and the end of this series. What did you think? I'm really, really pleased with this. I, I have been waiting to do the Juno 106. I've actually had it in my rack now for a year, waiting for me to have the time to actually dedicate to upgrading this and uh, create this series for everybody to watch. I do have quite a bit more learning to do with the Kiwi 106 upgrade to really get my head around how the sequencer works and how all the parameters work, but I'm really excited about what I'm gonna be able to do with the synthesizer and I'm just in love with the sound. I mean, everybody loves the sound of a Juno 106. That's why it's such a famous synthesizer. All right, what do you think? What comments do you have? Do you see any questions, any comments, any uh, suggestions, corrections? I really appreciate all the interest and likes and comments that people have left on these videos. It seems like a lot of people, a lot of you guys have this, a Juno 106 in your basement and it's not working and it's really gratifying. I had several people contact me and say, Oh, you know, I have a Juno 106 and it's broken and I didn't dare touch it, but now that you've done it, I think I can. And so they're going to have a crack at fixing their Juno 106, which is fantastic. I love hearing that kind of stuff. And of course, I've left links in the description for all the different products and tools and things that you saw me use here. 
Uh, I will add one from my oscilloscope. I know not many people are going to be able to afford to buy a, an expensive oscilloscope to be able to do the kind of calibration I was doing. Maybe yours doesn't need calibration. Um, you know, some, some of what I was doing with the oscilloscope, you could probably do by ear if you had a good reference. Maybe you could play a note on, a, on another synthesizer. Oops. Maybe you could play a note on a different synthesizer and then just, you know, match it up with what you're hearing. That's a, that's a possibility. E even if you have one that's not, not functioning, you can get it functioning just by following some of the directions I gave and, of course, following that service manual. If you have 10 or 15 seconds to spare, I'd really appreciate if you clicked like on this video and just left me a quick comment. Tell me what you thought. Did you like the video? Uh, is there anything I left out? Do you wish I'd done something different? And the reason for that is because YouTube algorithms really like when people like and comment on videos. And the more interaction the YouTube algorithms see like that, they think, okay, this is a great video for people who love synthesizers like me and you, and therefore it's going to show my videos to other people who also love synthesizers, which is great. So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. And of course, if you like this video and you want to see more stuff like this, and I'm posting stuff all the time, click subscribe and you get notified every time I post one. That's it for the Juno 106. Thanks for watching.